Hello, everybody. Welcome into another episode of Debate Night. We are back once again, and today we have kind of a special episode. We're naming this one the episode of the people, and the reason being every single question on tonight's show was submitted by the people. Uh, we recently had a Twitter prompt. It was actually for Grip Locked, but a lot of questions were brought on that we didn't answer on the Grip Locked podcast or some that we wanted to debate here. And then I also took some suggestions from our usual uh, prompt suggestion QR code that I always give a chance to, to scan at the end of the, the show. And there's that link in the description. So we have a lot of interesting topics today. It's not as current event related uh, since there hasn't been disc golf uh, over the weekend, you know, it's kind of been a little bit of a lull in the season right now as we get ready to gear up again. Um, so a lot of these are more related to the scene as things stand. Um, and yeah, just some bigger picture, picture questions in general. So it should be an interesting show. It's what the people want to see. You know, they submitted these. So we're going to debate them here on this episode. But without further ado, let's introduce our analyst for the night. Brody Smith is in the house. Bummed yeah. up. Yeah, this is, this is a great episode for me, man of the people. Um, excited to see what the uh, what, what what the people want to hear us talk about. Um, but I can tell you one thing: Brandon Hodgins, he wants to let me know that Trevor is the host, not Brody. The lag is only a problem for him because he can't cut in and interject during someone else's turn, which should be disallowed for everyone except the host. Brody, please let us hear the others uninterrupted during their turn. <laughs> so I will only be talking during my turn. No rebuttals this episode. And that's it. That's not fair because that was the lag's Rebuttal. fault. That was the lag's <laughs> fault. I, I, that was, yeah, I, I don't think that, that, that was possible. Wait, are you talking on my turn? Was it your turn? <laughs> show, the show hasn't started yet. Yeah. Uh, Gary is also back in the house with the brick wall behind him as always. Yep. 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 Uh, we're in black this time instead of red. Brody, I hope you read the comments under that one because I was the man of the man of the people and I had your back in that in that uh, reply thread letting them know that it. the lag was – lag on here is hard to deal with. People got to It was lag gate grace. for sure. It was lag gate last last week. It absolutely was. Um, Jake is here as well, enjoying his sunny West Coast afternoon. Oh yeah, and uh, this is my fourth time on the show, and I'm so far three for three in tying Brody for last place. So I've decided I'm more on a beat Brody conquest rather than a win debate night conquest. So again, <laughs> for the people, by the people, <laughs> you got to start something. Like shot. <laughs> Um, and then I gotta, gotta do something, man. A shot. Hey, you know, you gotta find your, you gotta find your spot here. Um, and then we also have Lucas. It's been a little while, but Lucas is back. Yeah. Good to be back. Armed with a master's degree. Now we'll see. Let's if that go. Oh, congratulations. Thank, Thank you. Yeah. Definitely exciting. Sweet. Awesome. All right. We see, we have educated people on the show comments, you know, <laughs> Put some respect on their names. Um, you have to have a master's degree actually to be on the show. That's something crazy. Like you, you mm. might not know that, but every guest on here has a master's degree. Brody, what's your master's in? Too many to count. <laughs> too, too, <laughs> Which one? The show would be too long. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, we're gonna get right into the first topic. Like I said, these are all fan submitted, so just know that I won't mention it every time. Um, let's get on with the first one. This one I really wanted to talk about because. Last episode, things got really contentious when talking about the PDJ and their contributions. So we're going to give some input here. Uh, the prompt <laughs> is, what could the PDGA do to add more value to their membership? As it currently exists, it seems like a mere tournament tax and active memberships are on the decline. So a lot of people have mentioned this before. Like, what is the PDJ doing? They make all this money from our membership fees. It seems like it, it's a discount. If you know it's that tournament tax, but what else could they be doing to add value to the membership? Maybe boost that active membership up. Brody, what do you think? So I'm going to take a shot at the person that said that uh, if Jack can't use notes, I can't compare disc golf to other sports. I think that's a wild take. I, I it still baffles my mind to think that like companies just operate with like hiring someone and saying, "Hey." I, I don't care that you were the VP of uh, Pepsi. You work here now. You're going to do it the way we do it. No, you hire people and bring them in because they have experience from other things. That's what disc golf should be doing as well. We should be looking at other sports. So that being said, I actually looked at the USGA in golf to see what do they offer. They offer diddly squat. They offer a <laughs> lot of stuff too that's trash that I wouldn't want. They have a newsletter that you get. You get a bag tag, trash. You get uh, the monthly um, uh, magazine like the PDGA does, trash. But the one thing I think the USGA does a good job of 
is they work a lot with the youth. They know that for golf to continue to grow and sustain growth or continue to sustain somewhat of relevancy, they need to have the youth. And they have a lot of things like the uh, putt, pitch, and drive or drive. I did that way out of Chip and putt? Yeah, I did that way out of rush. But they have a lot of programs to really help the youth. And um, I think that's something that the PDGA definitely could uh, not just be like, oh, we're just going to like jump on ones that already exist if they actually create it. And then the other thing I would say is if they worked on helping courses, that would be another thing. T pads, T signs, all those type of things with local courses. Those yeah. two things I think would have a big impact on the game. Totally agree with the youth side of things. That's, that's super important. And yeah, the USGA and golf in general focuses a ton on that these days. Um, Gary, what kind of things would you be looking to get in a value add from the PDJ membership? You know, Brody, I think that's a great point about the youth and getting involved there. I'm not really worried about the decrease in active members. That's normal in any industry, especially after a large boom, and a lot of the COVID players are becoming a little less tournament crazy these days. I think the PDGA needs to figure out its identity here. Is it only trying to exist for tournaments and ratings, or is it trying to attract members to build a community? Because if it's trying to exist for tournaments and ratings, get rid of the magazine, make it a digital newsletter, and it cuts the cost, and maybe people will read that. Lower the price to something like $25 or $30 dollars. You get your PGA card, maybe a sticker or two in a mini, and add in a discount to DGN, and we're all set. But if you're trying to build just beyond, you know, beyond tournaments, get rid of the magazine again or make it digital. Give us the, the DGN discount, and then bring in the affiliate discounts to disc golf products. I know they already kind of do these things, but make them more relevant. Use brands that are big. Um, talk. Use uh, brands that highlight up-and-coming companies. I used the Enterprise Rent-A-Car uh, perk a couple years ago, so that's a thing, I guess. <laughs> but it really feels like they want to be in option too because they claim that their memberships help uh, market and fund their majors. They promote charity events. They run youth education programs. They have a grant program that tries to take disc golf to other parts of the world and for upkeep of the IDGC. But if they want to do this, be more transparent with where the money's going. I'm very happy spending $50 if I can complete compete in uh, sanctioned events for the year. If I can get my discount for DGN and if I get to see my money go to work to help create something meaningful for kids and whatnot. If you're going to say you're going to do it, tell us what you're doing and make something. Uh, great points, Brody. Yeah, definitely not a ton of transparency when it comes to those sort of things. Uh, I think that that definitely would help because I, I do think like you mentioned the rent a car thing. There's a lot of benefits that. Well, I won't say a lot. There are some benefits that you do get that people probably don't even know about until you get mm -hmm. your card and look at the back of it or whatever it might be. So, yeah, it, it seems like they don't even really pitch that. Um, Jake, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I went through the laundry list of benefits that it offers as being a PDGA membership, and there actually is quite a lot, which is surprising because Brody brought up USGA. Some of their partners are companies like Rolex, Deloitte, like giant companies that are contributing to the USGA. But the PDGA, it's just members benefiting it. So I question how much you can add to that laundry list and still get people involved when with what they have now, they're not getting people involved. But I want to focus a little bit more on the question, too. It talks about declining PDGA members. I think that was always meant to happen. I think that the COVID bubble that disc golf experienced, it was always going to see a decline after, as it has with other things, you know, whether you're talking about crypto, Brody with trading cards. I don't know if you've seen similar in that industry, but everything that bubbled up during COVID tends to go back down. So I don't think it's time to hit the panic button. I don't think it's time to start adding things. I do think it's time to make sure um, we're having those youth programs. We're having the grow the sport programs. So that way we're able to grow and or so maintain the number of memberships rather than try to get it boosted back up to where it was before. I myself haven't renewed my membership in a couple of years because I'm just not playing tournaments, but I love disc golf and I'm gonna continue to play and get people involved. Um, but right now there's no benefits to the individual I see that they can really add on to say, hey, come back, You know, we miss you other than what they have currently. Okay, so not a ton of concern. Maybe it is just that tournament tax. Um, Lucas, what are your thoughts? Wrap it up for us. Yeah, I was trying to decide really where to go with this question because there are like more abstract things you could talk about, like the, the kids and the courses. And I think those are really great things, but I think right now the PDJ is almost spread too thinly in what they're trying to accomplish. It seems like they've got a little bit of a hand in everything and not really excelling at anything. And so I think that that's really damaging them in addition to them not being transparent about what they are doing. And so because we can't see what they're doing, we, we don't really know what's going on. And so we just assume that they're wasting things and we, they very well could be, we, we just don't know. 
What I think they really need to focus on is I agree with the identity piece, but also doing what they're supposed to do, and that's making rules for disc golf. I think the rules right now for play um, are shoddy at best sometimes. Like every time they come out with the, the rule updates for the year, it seems like there's some controversy that people have to talk about. A couple years ago, it was the Mandos and things being a people's lie that you couldn't move if you had to run up and if it wasn't in your standstill lie. And then more recently, we have the everyone keeping score, which people don't like. And then also like the biggest issue of like fairness in women's in the women's division. And so I think that them riding that ship, I think is most important to then move on to other things. You have to focus on the foundation first and then move out from there. Yeah, fair enough. And cause you know, at the, at the core of things, they do make the rules for our sport and that is a very important function. Um, I think you're right. When you mentioned them being spread thin, I think the PDJ has always had this identity crisis where they feel like if something's happening in disc golf, how is our name attached to it? They feel like this overarching kind of brand. And because of that, they get attached to so many things that really it's like, what is their actual involvement? You know, uh, like the pro tour, you know, they're, it's the official tour of the PDGA, but like what kind of relationship is that really other than we play by their rules and we use their rating system you know i think there's always been that kind of need from the pdga to just like be there when they could be an important organization that doesn't have to to try to do everything because in my opinion i think that growing the sport um ultimately should be should be a, a huge part of their identity and may not be as much as it should be these days um, you really but anyway, any other sport either like you yes yeah other organizations really being like the NBA or the MLB, like they're not involved in like amateur stuff at all, really other than like Brody was talking about, like some of the outreach stuff with kids and things like that. Yeah. It's, it's a weird one when you're a smaller niche sport and like growth has to be a focus, right? Cause like if you're a baseball and your players make hundreds of millions of dollars, you don't have to grow that sport. And also you're hundreds of years old. That helps too, but you don't have to grow that sport as much. It's going to attract people. There's a lot of infrastructure. It's weird being a younger sport and having to make that a focus because yeah, if you got big enough 50 years from now, it might not have to be as much of a focus because the, the sport will grow itself or at least sustain itself. Whereas at this point, like we've got to continue getting ourselves, you know, moving forward. Well, but, the marketing is very different. Yeah. Right. Like for baseball and basketball, football, like they're not trying to go out there to be like, Hey, this is football. What do you think? Do you like it? Like <laughs> right. every, everyone knows <laughs> right. what it is. Yeah. They're, they're more marketing towards like, Hey, there's a big game on tonight. Let's mm. show the storylines of why you should tune in and watch this. Yeah. Disc golf has the, there's tons of people that have no idea what it is. Yeah. No idea what it is. So like, that's the marketing that should be happening in disc golf should yeah. be trying to get people to like, at least be, you know, have ha, have an opportunity to check it out and and, and get to learn what it is. Yeah, it's and that's interesting. That's where uh, that's where the transparency piece is such a big thing because if they did a commercial where they talked about like what uh, educational program they were putting the money into and they showed the development of that, like you like you said, Brody, to really do something new, not necessarily invest in things that are already there. That to me would I think get a lot more people to go, oh, I can see my money at work. And I'd mm -hmm. feel better about paying the PDGA for something. But if they're deciding not to do that, then just lower the price and make it a, a tournament tax. Yeah. Can I have a bonus question for the panelists? Sure. Where, if golf is here, where is disc golf and fling golf? Oh, disc golf is much bigger than fling golf. In the perception of people that don't know either. No, I, I would. I, I just, I just watched a clip of a, the number one fling golfer in the world. More people would know what disc golf is. No, than fling but golf. I'm, I'm still to, saying to, like the perception, like the comments yeah. were destroying uh -oh. it being like, Oh, they'll make a sport about anything. Do we think disc golf, like what disc golf does where you're just chucking a Frisbee into I, a basket? I think versus... it probably looks a little bit better because it's so much more different. Fling okay. golf is basically like, we're going to play the same sport, but make it way easier because Here's... you just get to throw it like lacrosse. That, that's, so I think disc golf, because it's so much different, you know, because we're not throwing it at a flag stick. It would be with like, the yeah, hole. Right. we're throwing it at a basket with chains. Right. And, and, and a Frisbee this. is also a lot more like a golf ball. Because they're if both you, throwing a golf ball. You right, are right. Say, if you hit a golf ball well, it yes. looks awesome. But if you fling it, it looks stupid. <laughs> like it's not going very far. Okay. I was, making, yeah. this, yeah. I was making sure we're higher than fling golf. Because the comments were roasting this guy. <laughs> Look, we're higher than fling golf, but I think we're closer to fling golf than we are to ball golf. 
Oh, I'll say that. that much. I think that. that. that's a good statement. Yeah. yeah. Small Man, gap somebody, between somebody us. Make, but I'm going to make gap. a quote card of that one, Jake. We'll see how you, <laughs> yeah. see how you fare on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's great. Clip that I, never seen that. I need to share that. I need to definitely share that. Yeah. Uh, you ever <laughs> seen uh, Brian Scalbrini say to uh, some kids who are playing basketball at a gym, he's like, I'm closer to LeBron than you are to me? Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. one of my it's, favorite clips of all time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, listen, I watched a guy play fling golf in person uh, a few weeks ago. It was this older guy, you know, they have the, the, that giant pole and it like adjusts because you can use it as like your putter and your driver. Get and dude was just it. like, he's just trotting along, flinging. The, I'm like, that just can't be fun until you're like, mm. once you're within three holes, once you're within like a hundred yards. Yeah, I get that. It's but really like, fun for three holes. But and like then after the that, tee? it's kind of like, I, I, someone give me a golf club. Let me yeah. start, hitting, <laughs> let me start like, hitting this thing. Like I would love to have it from a hundred yards and in, I'd probably be a lot better. Putting's the same thing. You just put the, you put the fling yeah. stick on the ground, you putt with it. So like, no, that's like, not get, different at give all. Give me that thing in a bunker though. We're getting up and down. We're figuring yeah. it out. I, I'd be curious to see what the opposite perspective is, is like, what do like traditional golfers think about both disc golf and fling golf? Like to them, are they more willing to go disc golf seems like more of a sport to me or are both those things just mockeries oh, yeah. we're already doing? I don't know. I don't know. Fling golf, man. I, I'm not super plugged in the scene. Uh, all right. We're going to move on to our next topic shout here. Shout out to fling golf, bro. Yeah. Shout out fling golf, man. Who's the, who's the goat? Um, that's a new finals question. <laughs> uh, all right. We're going to talk a little bit about post-production content. Um, not something we talk about a ton anymore. I mean, you know, this, this platform is very focused on the live event. Um, we're, we're pretty current, but it's a huge part of our sport. Even now, you know, most of the disc golf is viewed from a post-production standpoint. So, um, one of the fans wanted to know, has the media consolidation made post-production content worse? We now have one card coverage that gives the whole story in a less thorough manner. When we used to have separate coverage for the top three cards did the pro tour pull the plug on this move too soon so obviously they're referencing the fact that we used to have all these different companies um covering the cards whereas now they're condensing it and bringing it in um doing it kind of in a different manner so gary what do you think do you a big big uh, post-production consumer and do you think it's gotten any worse I, I think it's only worse for one group of people, and that's the players in the second and third card who aren't playing well that also get to be on coverage because they happen to be on the card that weekend. Um, because time isn't being spent on storylines that don't matter. But for context, let's look at the Jomez numbers because at this point in this in the season last year, the FPO was averaging averaging two hundred and eighty two thousand views per event compared to two hundred and ten thousand thousand views this year mpo is averaging 1.1 million views per event compared to 964,000 this year so numbers are lower but despite all that um i i think the consolidation has made things better for a number of reasons because when you think about it viewer time is at a premium these days there's so many things to watch um and having it consolidated into one round with the chase card check-ins and the highlight packages it lets you enjoy the biggest moments of the event without having to endure the bad rounds from players that just aren't relevant anymore um, and in the old system, if a chase card had the winner on it, then it kind of makes the lead card video you're watching a little meaningless. It might make it still fun for the diehards, but kind of meaningless. But here's the thing no one's talking about. Um, the old system wasn't sustainable in the slightest bit. Gatekeeper Media, GK Pro, the Central Coast guys, they couldn't keep up financially with that system. And it would have been, I think they would have been gone in a few years anyway. Um, in, in, a, in a Reddit thread, Ian from Central Coast actually said that last year he lost tens of thousands of dollars on Central Coast, and he doesn't think he'd start a disc golf media company today. Um, so I think this, this this consolidation freed up other channels to pursue other creative means, which is better for them, and it put more resources into creating one best possible product for us. The consolidation was a good thing. Okay. All right, Gary, on board with the consolidation. Um, Jake, do you share the same feelings? I actually do, yeah. And one point that I thought Gary was going to touch on, and he almost did, but we just talked about growth of the sport and people wanting to pay for disc golf services. If people are checking out the recorded rounds and, hey, they missed out on chase card coverage, maybe that compels them more to pay for the DGN subscription, right? Maybe it drives more people to live disc golf and, and stimulates the economy of live disc golf a little bit more, right? So it'll drive more people to that, drive more people to the membership packages as well, right? Because they get that discount. And maybe that's when we start to see the wheels turn. I think eventually, though, with the con consolidation, we'll see more cameras out on the course. We'll see more coverage across all the different cards. But that's going to take some time. So right now, I think it's a good move to drive more people towards the membership, towards the DGN subscription. And then eventually, we'll see post coverage start to get a little bit more uh, wide scoped in terms of what they're covering in, in different cards. 
Um, personally, I didn't have time to watch three hour long videos to catch up on the tournament that I missed the weekend before. I only watched lead card coverage anyway. Um, now, if there was a winner off chase card, I only watched chase card coverage. But again, that's something that I think will compel people to the live coverage more. And hopefully we'll see a lot more subscriptions and a lot more money going into this so that yeah. it can get better over time. I think that's a relevant spin because for, you know, Gary kind of mentioned the diehards. There are people that are looking to get um, a large consumption and volume of disc golf. And if they were the people that were watching every single card before they wanted to get as much as possible, that does lead you to live disc golf at this point in those, in those longer recorded rounds. So that's a, that's a good point there, Jake. Um, Lucas, what do you think about the post-production scene at the moment? Yeah, I think if you're talking about worse in quality, the answer is no. I think Joe Mattis continues to get better. Uh, worse in quantity for Pro Tour, obviously, yes. Worse in quantity for other tournaments, no. There's been a lot of other like A-tier tournaments popping up on my YouTube to go and watch that these uh, smaller companies have gone and started covering again that they haven't been the past few years because they've been on the Pro Tour covering second and third card, which, as we've said, people weren't really watching anyway unless they were just – bored and had nothing else to turn on while they did their homework or whatever it was. And so I think that they did not pull the plug too soon because that allowed them to go back to filling that media space, that market share that they were not able to fill before um, while they were on the pro tour when it, they weren't really contributing that much anyway. Live disc golf, I think is obviously we know live is king. Live is what's important. And people really weren't going back and watching third card anyway. And if they were, now they have the option to go watch a different tournament, which personally I would rather do anyway. And so I don't think that it's gotten any worse in terms of quality or quantity. Um, I don't think the Pro Tour pulled the plug too soon. I think that this is just really setting up people for what disc golf was going to be later anyway. And so I don't see that being an issue. Yeah, definitely. Um, definitely allows some more niche uh, tournaments to get coverage. Um, those companies that have still stuck around need something to film. Obviously, I do agree, though. Uh, yeah, those those second and third cards were prime white noise coverage. That was like the best thing to do in college is throw one of those up on the dorm. Like, oh, yep. sick! Shasta Chris is throwing bombs out there. <laughs> it's that type of thing. Um, Brody, I know you're not a huge. Well, actually, no, you are kind of a post-produced consumer, so. Let's hear your take on this. Well, I think everyone was kind of saying the same thing, which is the one thing I think that we we left off though is the amount of content that's being created outside of coverage has drastically increased. The number of podcasts that people are listening to now is way higher than it was a couple of years ago. The amount of, amount of people that are making disc golf content is way higher, and then the amount of people that are making disc golf content that are actually touring pros is way higher. No one was doing, not that many people were doing that years ago. And so now you have this idea of where everyone has only a, so like kind of what Jake was, I think was saying earlier, like he only has a certain amount of time. So he's going to pick and choose what he's going to consume. And so if you're already listening to this podcast, you're going to watch this practice round, you're going to listen to this podcast, and then you're going to watch some coverage you're probably not going to be watching three, four or five hours of coverage. So you're going to pick and choose. I think that's a big factor. And that being said, like, it's all about this, right? This card right here, that's out of 10. There's only 10 of these cards created. So the scarcity of this card, that's what brings the value. And that's what, that's what the pro tour has right now is the scarcity of it. it, it right now, they're not going to allow people to just show up and live stream and be like, hey, yeah, you can live stream it to your Instagram. Anyone can watch. I think when they were smaller, they wouldn't care. But now they want to control all that content and control all that themselves, which I think is a smart move and something that we've talked about for a long, long time. So it's good to see them finally doing that. Really good point. Was that an eBay store plug? Uh, this is going to PSA and will not be for sale. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll give you the I'll give you the fourth point then because I just that is a twenty five hundred dollar raw. Okay. Okay. Um, that's yeah, a big, that is, that's a big boy card. That's super yeah, valid though, because people do have finite time, and they're mm -hmm. you know, as far as disc golf content, especially produced disc golf content goes, coverage was as as good as it got. You know, it was basically coverage and in the back. All you had. That's all there really was, um, and there was a lot of just like homemade stuff. You know, it's crazy to think that. 
foundation and what we do is we're we're one of the first people to really like make a channel based off of just disc golf content aside from touring pros and coverage um that just shows you how young our sport is because if you look at all any other sport or hobby there is so many um personalities getting involved in it and it has boosted a ton um over the last five years or so so that is that's a very good point um okay we're gonna move on here to our next topic talk a little bit about more about the the disc golf economy um talk about innova a little bit so Another submitted question was Innova correct and in not overpaying pros and handing out huge contracts during the COVID boom. It appears the bubble is right on the edge or has already burst. Active PDGA memberships are down, low pro tour attendance, and increasingly expensive discs are all happening now. So whatever you think about um, you know, the bubble or anything like that, that might change your opinion on this. But what do you think about in Innova strategy? Because I think one thing we can agree on is it always has seemed like Innova were not the first people to just throw the bag out at huge, massive teams. Um, do you think that strategy is paying off or not really? Jake, what, what are your thoughts? I think, yes, it's paying off, which is funny because when it was first happening, I was like, they are losing their entire team. And for what? Um, but I never stopped buying Innova. And I think that's an important thing about it being Innova specifically is that they've sponsored just about every winner of a, a major, of a touring pro, I mean, everybody over the past 20 some odd years, right? So they've had a lot of success. They've gotten their name out there. They're a staple. And if you look at their current touring, touring team, they still have winners. They have Calvin, they have Owen, they have Haley King, Cat Merch. Um, they have players who can, can pull out a win every once in a while. And we don't know Calvin's contract as far as I know. Uh, so not to say they didn't toss the bag at him, but I think that Innova made the right move in waiting it out. I think they knew they were a staple. They knew they could move plastic and would continue to for years. And they had a team that could really hold it down over the next few years. They invested in the, the younger players, I'd say more so on the FPO side. Uh, I didn't even mention the Europeans that they have. And we've talked about the growth of Europe on the tour. And on the FPO side, it seems like that was the right decision. Um, so I would just say that, you know, at first I was not a fan of it. I thought they should keep some of the big names around. And now I'm starting to see that maybe they were playing chess this whole time and they know they're going to be safe no matter what happens to this bubble. Yeah, definitely some reliance on their name uh, to kind of carry them through. Um, Lucas, what are your thoughts on Innova's business strategy over the past few seasons? I think honestly the smartest part about Innova's business strategy is them not broadcasting what they are paying. So you don't know if they made good deals or not because – they just did what they did. They kept Calvin the best player in the world. They allowed to keep their other old names like Sexton and Germ and all those other people while not having to disclose these other things. So now we know like, oh, these people are getting overpaid. Like that's too much money for what they're getting from those pros. Whereas Innova, you, we can sit here and still talk like, oh, Innova was playing chess the whole time. And now they're in the plus because they didn't overpay when really we don't know if they overpaid or not. They paid Calvin enough to keep him on the team. They paid the other players enough to keep them that they wanted. And um, like Jake was saying, they kept a lot of good FPL players as well. And all the Europeans like Evelina, who's really having a big season right now for them. And again, also to Jake's point, people still buy Innova. Innova is still a main staple in pretty much everyone's bag. You can't replace Firebirds. You can't replace other things that they make in some people's bags who, who like the overstable stuff. And so... I think that uh, Innova, in the long run, they're probably definitely played it correctly, but not necessarily in terms of not handing out huge contracts because they still might have. But they kept it on the down low because they didn't know what the market was going to do. And I think that was the better decision as far as that goes. Yeah, you keep the cards close to your, your chest. It's a lot harder to be judged on those moves for sure. Um, a lot of our judgment was just based off of names being moved here and there, but we don't, yeah, we don't know the payment, certainly not public information. Um, and it, it helps to be the King and be one of the oldest brands out there for sure. Um, Brody, what do you think about all this? Yeah. So the interesting about this, the thing about this is we, we have for sure seen companies that have market share just all of a sudden disappear. Like the one that jumps out to me the most is blockbuster. Like I, that might be a little bit past a lot of your guys' ages, but I remember high school coming home, you know, my mom being like, Hey, we're going to go to blockbuster. And that was like the biggest thing we would do pretty much all month and just walking around, look at that was massive. And now it's gone. And it's because I don't think they were willing to change and adapt with the times. Now 
when everyone was shelling out money, we were thinking that's what Innova was doing again, right? I think a lot of people are being like, oh, watch out for Innova. But if you really look at it, and they've and um Lucas actually just basically said the three people that I'm gonna say here, I think it was Lucas, or it might have been Jake. I can't remember who said it, but they looked and they said on the MPO side, let's have the number one player. Boom, Calvin, Mark Dunn. Okay, so now we're gonna have someone that's gonna be in the spotlight, winning tournaments or putting himself in contention. All right, what's the other thing that we need? We need the social media side. We need the content side. Okay, let's have the two people that are going to be on commentary, going to be on Jomez, going to be their faces in front of everyone as well. Big Germ Sexton. So they have both. I think that's what teams should be looking at is can you have someone on the social media side? Can you have someone on the playing side? Does having 10, 15, 20, 30 people on the playing side actually help you? That's a question that you got to make. Yeah, there is always that question of, you know, volume with a team, like a team like Discraft versus just having those key pieces and and how much does that translate? Uh, Gary, what do you think about all this? I, I think, first of all, to start saying that whether or not a company was correct or not correct really isn't easy because it's the free market. Things could have changed and it could have not been successful because um, consumer habits change and pros aren't always the most predictable. However, sitting back on it now and looking at everything that happened, I think they can be very happy. Like we all talked about here, if you look at their star team, you got Evelina Own, Kat Mersh, Henna, Jessica Weiss, Haley King, uh, Jennifer Allen, Juliana Corver. That's a stack group of FPO players that have a combination of experience, young blood, um, U.S., European, everything. On the MPO side, they've got their seasoned veterans with Sexton, Germ, Philo, and Barsby. You know, guys that are carrying the flag every single week. Uh, their talented core of Freeman, Double G, and Bradley Williams, and the most dangerous player in the world, Calvin Heimberg. And how do they manage it? Like people have said here already, you know, they consistently fly under the radar with their contracts. And they don't make all their deals public. And their team, they're, they're full of grinders because that's how the structure of a lot of the deals are going, at least from what we know so far. Um, then they're an industry giant because they are. They don't beat you over the head with a million plastic types. They don't often price gouge you as a consumer all that often. They're just are nostalgic because they were a lot of our first discs that we ever owned. Um, and I think of all the companies, they make the easiest runway for new players to get into the sport. And they're trying to innovate all the time. But these decisions won't be as important as the decisions they have to make in three to five years when their vets are thinking about retirement. Heinberg's going to want more money. And as MVP pushes their way into the conversation, how are they going to continue to stay relevant? Only time's going to tell on that one. Yeah, I think I think when it comes to Innova, their their strategy has had a lot to do with their name reliance. And, you know, they were one of the first uh, to the sport, certainly the, the most popular during the 90s, early 2000s. Uh, it's really only been recently, you know, we saw Discraft, you know, with Paul's move, especially Discraft really jump in and take, take control of the sport at a really crucial time when all these new players are coming in and they didn't know about the nostalgia of Innova necessarily. Um, because when you used to get into disc golf, you stumbled upon it a lot of times in a sporting goods store. And that's where you saw the Innova plastic. That's how I felt, found it. But now you also have MVP that's, that's pushing too. So it's going to be that question of, you know, Innova has the long-term relationships. They're in the sporting goods store. Um, they have the iconic molds and people will always go back to them, I think, but how long will that last out when you have all these new companies and some ones that are, are really making huge moves these days? Um, it's tough to say it's, it is really tough to say. I, I, we'll, we'll find out in the long run, but as far as the player contracts, I'd agree with most of you saying that I think they're probably on the right side of history with this one. And every time it seems like their team is going to need something, they'll find that piece, you know, and, and, and make sure they fill it out. So, um, yeah. All right. I never thought I'd see the day where Innova gets compared to Blockbuster, though. That one, yeah. was, that was a take no, right it, there. It could have been Blockbuster. And Rudy, been, okay. And, right. A lot of people were thinking what, when everyone was signing people and Innova wasn't, and there was letting people go, everyone thought that this was the end of Innova. Just That's to help, literally right. everyone was saying. Just to help you with the Blockbuster timeline, I grew up with Blockbuster as well. I would say Redbox, aka the Blockbuster Killer, probably entered the scene around the time I was 11, was my, 10 or 11. I was going to say that was when I was in college, I want to say. Mm, that'd be about like right 2000, there. 2000, yeah. like 2005, 2006, I want to say, right around that yeah, time. Probably probably. around there. That would have been yeah. like seven around that. Yeah. It, yeah. That, so I, I had a little bit of Blockbuster. So you got a little Blockbuster? A little okay. Blockbuster, but Redbox was very big for me and then eventually Netflix, but mailing the movies, Netflix, not yeah. streaming Netflix, yeah, which I never thought that was cool. I never did that. No, we didn't really do it either. I was yeah. anti that. I, 
Redbox was awesome. You go get some Redbox groceries. rocked. <laughs> you go get some groceries yeah. on your way out. You're like, hey, hey, mom, can we uh can we a, dollar. Movies? a yeah, dollar? It's only yeah. a dollar. Let's see what movies they have. Yeah, Redbox, Redbox kicked butt. And I think you could rent could you rent video games yeah, from there? Eventually, yeah. eventually. Yeah, that was electric. Yeah, Generational was awesome. run from yeah. uh Redbox. Shout <laughs> out Just go out there. ones. I only did this once, but I did one time put another video game that I didn't want back into the box that I rented and then put it back in the red box. Confessions? They're going to put yeah, you in a only cell. Did it once. Mm. I don't know if I'm going to, if FBI is going to be at my door tomorrow. They're going <laughs> to watch the game. You, like, you were probably the one that created them to have to start making the uh, cases clear with, with the scan <laughs> codes on the, on the actual games. Yeah. Mm. I, was, I was one of them. I contributed to it. What was Proud the game, Jake? Yeah. What was the game? If I could remember right now, that's the worst part. Is that I don't even remember. You committed so many was crimes, you can't even remember the, the game. game. Fire. No, no. I wanna, filter. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was Star Wars Battlefront for the uh, PS2 or whatever. Oh, nice. I think well, it was that one. It that's understandable. I, I, I give I, you a pardon I, for that one. I, I beat one of the Star Wars games in like a matter. It was like an. It was like a hundred and twenty game hours, and I beat it in a week. Uh, when I had um, what I have? I had mono. Classic. And I just sat in my bed and played the game for like 15 hours for a few few uh, few days straight to beat it. Tales that was time, man. That was good times, man. <laughs> yeah, that was good times. <laughs> All right, uh, we got one more topic. We're gonna talk. We're gonna talk some more money here. One more topic before we get into the finals. This one has been attracting a lot of news in the disc golf world. Um, so. One of the many reasons people are attracted to disc golf is because of a lower cost of entry compared to some sports. That being said, the Saki Bomb General is 32, I think it's actually 32.99 for a single disc. Bags and carts can easily cost over $200. Are we beginning to lose the low cost of entry that brings people to the sport in the first place? Is this idea of disc golf being uber cheap more inflated in our minds than true in reality? Um, Lucas, what do you think? Yeah, I think I'm going to start on the first or the last part of the question, actually, about whether or not that is the case or not. I think that part of it is true, yes, but I think what's also true is that part of the in, the the low barrier is that you can spend as much or as little as you want. If you want to buy a lot of really nice discs and go out and play, if you want to buy the best bag and you want to be like the new guy who's the tryhard who has all the best discs in the best bag, you can definitely do that. Or if you just want to go out and get a bunch of DX stuff from uh like play it again or something like that you can also do that so that aspect i think is a little bit overblown in our minds and the other contributing factor is the low cost uh for athleticism so anyone can go out and play disc golf you can go out uh, and you don't have to be super athletic to get pretty decent at disc golf you also don't have to be very athletic at all to go out and play and just have fun like disc golf can be fun whereas other sports are more physically demanding i think and also to be really good there has to be a, a sense of athleticism about you as well whereas disc golf it applies more to people who don't have the i guess what you would consider the typical athletic background and so i think that aspect as well is something that contributes to a lot of the demographic you see playing disc golf as opposed to other sports that's what allows them to get in yeah fair, fair enough they're definitely a uh there is a cost associated on the on the side of athleticism and what sports demand. Um, okay, Brody, what do you think about all this expensive disc golf stuff? If you care, just stop buying it. Yeah. Like, I mean, people, companies will learn real quick. Oh, like if we came out, what are we selling the man of the people shirt for? Probably 25 bucks. So if we came out and we try to sell that for $79.99 and not a single person bought it, we would probably adjust the price and we would adjust the prices of future shirts. Now, if we came out with seven ninety nine and we sold a thousand of them, are we dropping the price? No. So here's the thing. Every, every sport, every, everything in the world has this everything. You can go out and buy a really, really nice car. That's going to do the same exact thing as a really cheap car. It's going to get you to and from now. Sure. Will there be other things, uh, you know, amenities and stuff like that mixed in there of course but as far as just getting from plan a to plan b it's going to do the same exact thing so i don't think anyone that's buying this disc thinks all of a sudden they're going to be way better but they want to have that disc and if you want to have that specific disc with rick uh ricky's stamp and all that and you're willing to pay a premium 
companies are still going to do it and that is completely fine you can go and find this in literally every industry out there there's going to be stuff that's going to be just more expensive and it's going to just have a little logo on it and that's the only reason that it's more expensive and people will still buy it so if you don't want this stuff to be so expensive just stop buying it and then they'll, ha- they'll have to they'll have to lower the price free market brody you're here with the lesson hey you bought the prada frisbee so you would know better than anybody else yeah that was a terrible purchase that was a, <laughs> gotta be honest that was that was just a whammo with a prada logo on it i think we, we still have it to this day yeah, um <laughs> the sling was sick though oh it's fantastic yeah um all right gary talk about the free market talk about it <laughs> what are some of the issues i mean the, the the consumer the producer price index for plastic is higher than it's ever been before and we all know the people are pinching pennies like no one has ever been before it's just so expensive right now if you look at the cost of the the premium discs back in the mid 2010s of like 15 to 18 dollars the new market for inflation it comes up to 23 to 25 dollars so this sitting at 33 is it is more expensive but simply put like brody said no we're not losing the low cost of entry here because the market is expanding and with any market expansion you see an influx of both value brands and pr- high premium brands you still can get your starter packs for less than 25 dollars you can get inexpensive bags and look at the value in used bins that's dramatically increased the more and more discs have been traded in recently uh, i go there four years ago and you'd find dog chewed discs and things you'd never heard of before but now you go to a used bin and there's some high quality discs for low discounted prices and that's the glory of the free market consumers lead the charge and everything if they don't buy it it's going to change or it'll go away if they do buy it then more of that thing is going to happen. New premium lines are going to be set because there's always going to be a need to have the best product out there. Also, acting like high disc prices are a new thing is crazy because if you ever looked at a, a private sale online, I mean, people buy what they're going to buy. If you want to introduce new consumers, direct them to the value. One of the best things I've, I've seen at least recently is the foundation care stuff you guys are doing. It's genius, protecting consumers from overspending. And that's the case because with the invent of every mechanism for costing money, something is invented to save consumers money. That's how free market works. Welcome mm-hmm. to business, people. We well, went for points on that one. Beautiful. Welcome to business. <laughs> Welcome to business. Oh, man, I will say. I know Gary got one. a master's in <laughs> foundation. business. Foundation ad read in there, too. Just Gary's not a businessman. He's a business, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jake. Are you as fired up about the free market as everybody else? Somebody play the eagle uh, squawk in the background here. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, look at who the Ricky Wysocki discs are for, right? They're for fans of Ricky Wysocki, right? So if you're paying for that disc, you assume that a good chunk of it's going to go to fund his tour, which, you know, after they did the whole uh, announcement tour and talked about the million dollar contract again, you know, there's still people that are going to go buy his disc and support him on tour. And Brody, from an amateur perspective, I've met people who buy those discs thinking, now I'll throw like Ricky. It very much is a real thing at the amateur level. Oh, yeah, there's idiots everywhere. I'm not, yeah, I'm, I'm not, denying I'm two that. of that's them. just not, that's not the majority of people though. Yeah. I'll buy three of them and then still wonder why I'm bad, but that's who the, these discs are for. So low cost of entry for a consumer. I mean, Innova starter kit, Innova starter kit, Innova again, not going anywhere is $20 right now on Amazon. You get three discs and there's your starter pack right there. Throw them in a plastic shopping bag. And that's how I got started, right? That's how I think most people get started. So the cost and the, the barrier of entry is so low. There are no beginner level courses that I've been to that cost money to play. Of course, once you get to more advanced courses, it costs money. Um, and I think we need to make sure people know that when we introduce them to the sport. It's, hey, this is all you need right now. Get into it if you want, and it's just going to cost you 20 bucks. Now, I mean, I look at other sports, right? And those are the ones that have high cost of entry, right? Golf clubs are expensive, even the cheapest ones. So. I mean, I think we're doing all right for cost uh, and barrier of entry. I don't see any problem with it. Yeah, I think the, what I was saying the other day is with this whole issue of the perception of cost is, yes, if your buddy comes up to you and says, I want to get into disc golf, you can give him a route to the sport that is dirt cheap. A lot of times, a lot of times because it's discs are so cheap, you can just say, here, have three of mine. Like that's yeah. that's even a great part. My bigger issue is – the customer that walks into the store says, and he, and, and just at first time going into the store, he's heard disc golf is a cheap sport. Disc golf is a cheap sport. Walks up, picks up that general and says, how much is this one? And somebody says $33. It might be like, Oh, interesting. Okay. So Trevor, here's where I think 
we disc golf can improve and that is on the educational side of when it comes to selling discs now play it against sports they don't care they just want to make a buck right Mm -hmm. but like something like our store does and hopefully other stores around there if there is someone walking in or if someone's listening to a podcast or youtube video or whatever like I was also one of those guys too that said like, Hey, what do the pros hit in golf? They all hit blades. Okay. I need to go and get blades. And then I went and I had someone that knew a lot more about golf than me. Tell me, no blades would be a terrible idea for you with where your skill level is right now. I think we need more than disc golf of where it's like, yeah, that disc right there, that's $32. Yeah. That's a really cool disc. If you can throw this fast, you can't throw this fast. So let's go over here and get this $10, $8 used disc that's going to actually fly way better for you. So I think that's where it's like we all are a little delusional. I remember, too, it's Christmas. I went nuts getting Gary Payton shoes, thinking I was just going to start being a lockdown defender in basketball because of these <laughs> basketball shoes. So we all have a little bit of a delusion in our heads. We just need someone to kind of smack that out and to tell us what we actually need to hear. Good point. You know, yeah. you know who has that delusion more than anyone else are the kids that are starting up in those sports, like you just mentioned. That's why we need those education programs to like give them the beginner disc. So when they tell their parents, I want to get into disc golf and I want this disc that Ricky Wysocki throws, there's someone there to say, Hey, maybe not, because then their parents think they're spending $35 for a disc that's gonna get chucked into a yeah. pond. Maybe, no kids, uh... no kids thinking like I need to have uh, stiff shafts in my clubs. No, in golf, no, no one's thinking like that's what I need to like actually make uh, me good at the age of ten. More, uh, more disc golf pros should probably start putting their like putting their names on like beginner sets. Honestly, it's very well, that's, weird. That's that's a company thing. That's yeah. like that's what these companies should be doing. Because like I, yeah. I, and I understand that like disc golf, it's not too much of a leap to get from the beginner disc to the advanced disc. But like you, you don't really see a lot of starter sets that are like really putting a player's brand on there. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. Cause if you go to like Walmart and target, like they have like big name, like for tennis, they have like big name people on the branding. It's like yeah. that person doesn't use that racket. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's like once they have the license, Roger Federer, they're chucking them on everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Got to get some, Scott, some Scott's tots discs out there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that was also- it. They just had a commercial for easy to throw discs. Cause I, I saw the commercial. I forget what brand it, it was. TV. No, for no, uh, silly. Yeah. Oh, was the lightweight <laughs> okay. stuff? The discraft lightweight stuff? I Does think he... it might have been discraft, but now, it only yeah. had FPO players will, throwing it in the commercial, I which I was like, words. hold on. I will eat my words a little because discraft did just run all of this. Discraft Z- does a good job. They um, ran all their Z light with players' names on each of the discs. So I'll, I'll eat my words on that. There's there's companies that are doing it. And we'll Paul's just, put his name F- on a bunch of discs that he doesn't throw either. So. Yeah, like the Hades. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did you have something to add, Lucas? Just that like disc golf is a little different than the other sports in that, like you guys were saying about the tennis stuff, there isn't a difference between what we're throwing and what the pros are throwing. Like we're throwing the same runs. They might get to pick the runs a little bit more, but we're throwing the same exact tools that they're using. Whereas in other sports, that's not really the case. Yeah. If you, if you want to buy a golf club or a hockey stick or really any other sport that functions at that level, I mean, basketball, football, there's a lot of sports where you're using the same equipment. Yeah, that's but not, even, it's only one. Like you're using the same balls also in golf right. sometimes. But, but even that's in, like, even in football, for an example, let me give you an example for football. Yes, that's the same football, but it's not prepped the way an NFL football is. They don't rub it down with mud and take off the shine. But that that can also be said about, and that's one thing I think that hurts disc golf a lot is like you see someone flip up a. And Trevor, we talked about this. You see someone flip up a nuke, and it's like that's not really a nuke. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. We'll so say in New England. In New England, we do deflate all our footballs. That is a common thing. Yeah, we have to. <laughs> Much like the pros. He did um, agree to it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it, it that's there's always there is a lot less of a difference between the yes. pro product. There's not I yeah, agree with that. It's not like when they're building out a golf club and you buy the one at Dick Sporting Goods, it's not the same um at all. Um, but yeah. All right, we're gonna move on to our finals here. We got Gary and Brody in the finals fun matchup oh boy um and we're gonna do a little more goat talk back to back weeks um gary would you like to go first or second i concede to the card master brody okay brody is gonna go first here's the question if Kristen tatar retired at the end of the season would she be the goat what is your best argument for and against this notion? I want to know how you would argue for it and how you would argue against it because I think there's a there's a couple ways to look at this. Brody, what do you think? 
I think this is a. I'm, I'm in the finals. I'm never in the finals. I'm getting distracted here. I'm in the finals. Um. Okay, so it's a field to get distracted. Yeah, it is what it is. The best argument, um, I would say, is just how dominant she has been in the short period of time that she's been playing. I think also she has taken what we thought at the time, Paige Pierce, as the best FPO player we've ever seen. She has absolutely dominated Paige Pierce in in basically head to head uh, over the last you know couple seasons. So I think that's the best argument of where she has been the most dominant player that we've ever seen, and probably the most complete player that we've ever seen in the deepest FPO field that we have ever seen. Mm-hmm. Now. <laughs> the against point would probably be she hasn't done it long enough. That would probably be the against point. I could easily see if she retired tomorrow, broken rib, I'm done, I'm out, I'm not playing anymore. We would basically say like, okay, she's the GOAT, but I I think it would be pretty quickly surpassed by someone a decade or two decades from now where someone else could come up and have a couple good seasons, but do it over the span of a decade. That's the only thing with her being over in Europe and not playing a lot in the United States at the beginning of her career. That's the only thing I would say that is a knock to her is she hasn't done it long enough. We want to see more, Uh, but she's got all the majors. She's beaten all the best players. She's come back, even though she hasn't done that as much as leading from the front. Um, She's kind of shown everything and she's really the one that's kind of elevated. I think the FPO field to what it is now because players know that they can't just show up and have their B game and win anymore. They got to come out and play, play their best. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Valid points on both sides. Gary, what is your um, response to this prompt? I won't lie to you. I'm, I'm kind of tired of goat conversations these days. It happens all the time, every single week, because it's just so subjective to whatever criteria you have for goat status. And we know this is a, a conversation of Paige versus Kristen. Uh, and the case for Kristen is that she's won six majors. Um, five of them I would consider in the modern era with stiffer competition. Um, she was the first thousand rated FPO player. I know ratings don't mean much to a lot of people here, but I got to tell you the common populace, it matters to them. So in their eyes, it matters. Um, I think she's the owner of the most dominant season we've ever seen last year. Skill for skill. I think she's the best FPO player we've seen from a talent perspective up to this point. But here's the case against her for Paige. Paige has won 17 majors. Five of those are world titles. And she's displayed top tier talent over the course of 12 years, which is great from a longevity perspective. Um, but if you care about titles, Paige is your goat. If you care about skill level, I think Kristen's your goat. Right now, if you hold me down to it, I think that I'd have to go to, to Paige because um, even though I think she's less skilled than Kristen, uh, even though I think that she had easier pathways to some of those wins at a number of those majors, uh, we live in an age of wins. I don't really like this take that much, but. Um, I don't have too many arguments against it. Uh, How could Kristen take that away from me? Um, I don't think she would need as many major wins as Paige to do it. I think a couple more world titles and a few other majors, like maybe she could get to 12 majors. That would be enough to make an argument for her. Um, But it's going to be tough because she started her dominance a lot later than Paige did. She's, she's older. It's she's less time on the end of her career. I think she'd still be dominant for a while though. Um, And the FBO competition is stepping up. I feel like exponentially every season it gets better and better. Ultimately, the best part about any GOAT argument, though, is is that you can pick whoever you want. You can use whatever reasoning you want. Um, If she retired at the end of this year, I know that when my son asked me about the history of disc golf someday, I'll talk about Paige Pierce being the greatest player that ever was. But I will tell him about Kristen Tatar and the era of dominance that she displayed where nobody could stop her. Trevor, can we go back and forth a little bit? Just no points on the table. I I just got just want to go back and forth with Gary real fast. Absolutely. Gary, the one thing though, that I think you're missing here in the goat debates that are real fun to do in other sports, right? We Mm -hmm. get the Jordan LeBron. They never played against each other, Gary. No, no. I never got to see them. The the funny part is Ronda Rousey was dominating 10 years ago before Amanda Nunes was even in the UFC. That would be an electric debate. Who's better? Ronda, Amanda. Amanda knocked the crap out of her, Mm -hmm. like literally stumbled her. No one's thinking Ronda Rousey is the goat anymore. And that's where it is. Paige Pierce is not out of her prime. She's not a 45, 50 year old lady Mm -hmm. out there trying to play against Kristen Tatar. 
they're roughly the same age. Yeah, no, I totally get that. It, 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 to me, personally, for me, I, I'll pick Kristen every day of the week. If you're asking me to start a company and, I, and, and put money in someone, it's Kristen. But to, to the populace and all the stuff, I think I think that Paige is there. I, I, I like talent more than I like wins. I never, I never dominated I've, her. That's I, the problem. I, I, I understand that. I've never been a titles guy. It's kind of weird because I'm the person who argues that Michael Jordan is the goat in basketball because – LeBron can't win in the finals when I feel like this is the opposite debate where it's like, it is. you know, Kristen it doesn't is. have as many titles, but it she's, is. she's such a, it's like, I, it's a weird place to be. But like, you're never, you're never going to hear, you're never going to hear people say like, who's, who's the goat, Josh Allen or Patrick Mahomes, because Patrick Mahomes has dominated Josh Allen. Mm-hmm. Now you will get the Patrick Mahomes or Tom Brady because those two didn't intertwine enough well, when they're both in their prime. Here's the kicker, though, Brody. Here's the kicker. Am I missing something here? The kicker is that Paige Pierce's dominance started in 2011, mm-hmm. so there was almost a decade of of dominance before Kristen arrived. So, wow, yes, and I know, I know we're we're big on the like age thing here. Don't and, tell and, me this. But I'm just saying a golfer's prime <laughs> does not have anything to do with their age. Brooks Kepka's prime happened happened a few seasons ago. He's still young, right? Like there are Jordan Spieth's prime happened when he first started playing golf. He's still young. So I I my struggle with this argument Kristen is two years younger than Paige. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Did, uh, your age does not define how good of golf you're playing at the time. No, no, no. I'm, uh, what I'm saying is I'm, I'm, I'm using the, uh, are you using the argument that Paige is older and now she's not no. as good as she used to be? Not no, because she's no, older. No, not I'm just saying she's not as good as she used to be. Maybe. I'm just throwing it out there. Just related to that she's not as playing as good as golf. And it doesn't have to be tied to her age. It's not mutually. They're not have to be mutually tied together. I, I know. I watched something, though. I, and, and, my and, whole and, thing with this argument is I and I don't know for sure. Like, I would need to watch a lot of old page um, clips and like tournaments. But I just can't decide if the page I was watching in 2015, 2016, 17 is the same page I was seeing in 2018 and 19 getting beat by Kristen. Like. I can't really tell when the fall off happened. And that's where I struggle the most with this is like, cause when I think of Paige Pierce, like I remember a way, way better disc golfer. And I, and maybe I'm just not remembering correctly. Mm-hmm. That That's the thing for me is with this argument is it's not just the skill level or the accolade thing. It's, it's like, I, I genuinely believe that Paige, the uh, Katrina Allen were better golfers back then. Um, and that's where it just throws me for a loop. I, I think, yeah, I think go back and watch some coverage and then come back to me because yeah, I, 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 I just, I, I just yeah. listened to someone. I, I think it was a golf podcast or something like that, where he was basically saying like, I haven't gotten worse. Like I'm, I'm better than I ever was. It's just everyone around me has gotten so much better. And yeah. that is at the end of the day, what is happening in disc golf. Certain players are not getting worse. In my opinion, it's mm-hmm. literally just every, the easiest way of looking at it is literally on MPO. Back mm-hmm. in the day, you could you could be a couple shots off the lead, five, six, seven, and have a top ten. Well, now, if you're that far off, you might not even be in the top twenty five. I, I can tell you confidently that Paige and Katrina's decline has nothing. Well, not completely has everything to do with strength of field because yes, you do have the Kristen and the Hen and the Evelinas, but they're finishing outside the top fifteen consistently. There's not that many new players that would be taking those spots. I and do Holland, believe Holland, Ella. Owen wasn't playing I don't, I don't believe core. that it's that dramatic. I think they would still be com- competing at a much higher level if they were still the golfers they were. Part of it's the courses too. Like Bernie made yeah, the argument a few weeks back in the day, it was just yeah. uh, who could throw the farthest. That, yeah, yeah. Who, I, who I think that's a big part of it. Throw far. I, I, I think just a big part of it. I just can't when I'm when I'm when we're going through the goat stuff because it's just so subjective. Like I can't think about what happened before someone's time, and I'm trying not to think about what could happen. I'm just trying to encapsulate the years they played and yeah. try to do some kind of apples to apples. And honestly, that's why I hate goat arguments because to me, I feel differently about a player than somebody else does. I like, it's just I just the overlap decided, is the hard thing that they have they, to, they have overlapped a decent yeah, amount. I haven't decided if I'm prepared to look at the end of Paige Pierce's career, like against Kristen, as a Michael Jordan on the Wizards situation, or is it not that serious? You know, and is Kristen that much that, better? Jordan was like forty. 
Well, I, I know, mean, I know. Going, I to, going to Lucas's saying, point, doing a sport where athleticism is very important. Right. But I'm just saying how <laughs> Look much? at Owen Scoggins. Owen Scoggins is 40 plus and she's right. winning tournaments and Golf. finishing second. Golf is significantly different. I, I got to check I, that. I got to make sure that I didn't just. I understand. <laughs> Owen Scoggins. Oh, when judging like a golf <laughs> goat thing, you know, obviously longevity 41. matters. Owen Scoggins yeah. is 41. Longevity does matter, but it's always going to be different because most golfers prime is not going to be directly correlated to age. Like that's just going to be the bottom line. Like Kristen, when we look back at it, when we're all said and done, we're probably going to look at her prime being from like age 28 to 35 or something like that. So it's, they're not tied as much as other sports. You can't just say, Oh, well they got old. So that's where it gets really fuzzy for me. My, my only thing is like my only, my only kind of counter argument to that Trevor is I think actually a lot of uh, players primes are actually going to maybe potentially come later in their career versus earlier yeah. Yeah. in their career. Because back in the day, if you were good and you just popped on tour, you could start winning instantly. Now that's going to be a lot harder now to win. And so you might need those years of like playing the courses, learning the courses, Certainly. kind of figuring that out. So, um, I mean, look at AB, for example, you want to tell me you take AB and you pluck him 10 years ago that AB took, took that long to win back then. 0% chance. The, AB, yeah. AB wins way more 10 years ago. The interesting thing is, I mean, you the gotta, courses they were playing 10 years ago. Yeah. Oh, that's, 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 okay, that's, that's, that potentially could be <laughs> true, but athleticism you, you is my good, point. It took AB yeah. a while to learn how to win. Sure. Athleticism Sorry. is a great argument, though, because if you look at Paige Pierce when she came into the sport, she kind of had a youthful athleticism. Like, I don't think of Paige Pierce as a, a, a natural, like, athlete who's grinding to, like, keep super healthy. Whereas Kristen, she came into the sport later, but after having successful athletic careers elsewhere. So she has more of a mature athleticism where she's kind of come into it as, at a later age. She's, she understands that she has to work harder. So she puts more time into certain parts of it. So yeah. her prime is delayed because she's coming into it with a mature athleticism where I think Paige's prime might be earlier because she's coming into it with that youthful athleticism. And now that she's getting into the later parts of her career, the times that she could have gone out and spent more time, like getting herself in better shape and honing yeah. her body for that kind of stuff. I mean, look, look at Paul, Paul identified that early and he decided to try to show people what athleticism into disc golf looked like. And that contributed to his dominance. And I think why he's successful for a longer stretch of time, because he's as a more mature athleticism than others. Can I ask one final oh. question? Yeah. Why Gary real quick. Why did you never bring up Juliana Corver as goat versus uh, Paige listen, Pierce? Juliana. Well, a part of it's because I have two minutes, Brody. I mean, Juliana sure. Corver. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Juliana Corver is a great one there. And I, I always want to throw respect to like Des Redding and some of those people who I feel like never get mentioned who yeah. laid some amazing foundations in the sport. But do you think that's because we discredit her wins more than now, like the wins now, right? Isn't that the idea? Is like that's oh, part of yeah, it. She, I think that's, that's part of the core of her generation falls into that, like that. that it, it gets far enough back that they look like legends of the game, not real arguments for the goat. And I'm yeah, wondering, is that, at all, but... I'm wondering, is that what we're gonna think of all pages, world titles, and majors well, ten years from now? I already think Maybe. about that for some of them. That's why yeah. I said it doesn't take. Yeah. It won't take Kristen as many major titles to get to the same yeah. place equally. I think most people would agree. Yeah, the Copenhagen Kristen... Open and right. the Australian yeah. Open. Most people would agree <laughs> that Kristen is is got to be, if not the goat, she's two or three seasons of this away from being undoubtedly. Yeah. I'll say bottom line. I think the most entertaining thing that could possibly happen in, in women's disc golf right now is Paige Pierce finding her game again yes. and, and all of a sudden yep, yep. winning tournaments because it would be awesome. It would be awesome to watch. Um, cause it would just tie, it would tighten that goat argument like up once again, and it would be awesome. So I think Paige Pierce yep. is the, is a fighter that got knocked out for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. she, she gonna... felt like she was invincible yeah. and yeah. she got knocked out for the first time. And we got to try to figure out like, can she mm -hmm. figure it out? Yeah. What, what did Mike Tyson is... say? Everyone has a plan to get punched in the face. Yeah. <laughs> and it goes, out yeah, I know this is the, I know this is the finals topic. I didn't make the finals, but I will just say the two M's of mentality and momentum. I think Paige Pierce's game was riding on that for a long time. Mm -hmm. She got beat once like Brody said, and I mean, I just remember her Instagram posts during that time were like weirdly like, ah, I'm not winning. It's fine.
Yeah, it's like, yeah. guitar, man. You got to do a lot of self discovery <laughs> when you start losing tournaments. Um, yeah. well, in any case, Gary is making a case for the uh, debate night goat at this point. He's rattled off quite a few wins this season. He's getting another one today. Gary, what about your goat argument? Do you have one? My goat argument? No, I, I don't know. I just enjoy doing this. I like talking disc golf. It's it's so much fun. And, you know, to, to the point that we made earlier, more and more people are doing this. I'm looking at starting something similar for myself. I I, I, I got to get all this uh, this fun and excitement of disc golf out. And what better to do on some sort of some kind of social media platform? Hey. But I, I won't I won't stand here and put my thing above me on a green screen. Whoa. Hashtag bring, oh, hashtag, hashtag bring it on, Rich. Hashtag bring it on, Rich. Hashtag bring it on, Rich. All right, Gary, man, we'll, I'd listen. I'd listen to your podcast. Hey, it, put in the comments down below. Who's your debate night goat? It can be somebody with a lot of wins or just somebody you like watching. Who is your favorite I think, uh, debate yeah, night cast member? I think Gary just said that Dustin wears a watch to tell time and he wears a watch to tell you how valuable his time is. <laughs> Shout out to Shannon Sharp. <laughs> um, in any case, if you want to submit a topic for debate night, we obviously did a whole episode of them today. You can scan the QR code here on the screen or click the link in the description. Love getting these topics. They've gotten better as the years gone on. I feel like you've started to figure out what I what we like to throw on this show. Um, so continue submitting them. I read them every single week. We've had over a hundred this season and we've got a whole bunch of season left to go. So thank you so much for submitting those and keep throwing them in there, throwing as many as you want, throw it at the wall till it sticks. One of them will get on here. And uh, thanks for watching this episode. We'll see you next, uh, next week with another one.